It has been pointed out that I've not done a project in quite some time and that needs corrected. So the project is going to be based loosely on something I made a while back. It was a decorative light which went into a sort of candelabra or chandelier type lamp holder and it had these little globes with LEDs in that just sort of hung down and it looked great, it looked fantastic because I used the warm white LEDs inside these retro style covers and it just gave that washed out retro look. So these holders are based on a string of lights I got a while ago back and the nice thing about these is that you can actually pop the cover off and the way they're constructed it's the standard sort of LED and heat shrink arrangement. But the nice thing is that you can actually retrofit these if I put this out of the way. I could show you them lit but that would just be LEDs lit up it wouldn't be that exciting besides I've got something plugged in already for a reason. But um, I found out that I could put these little Molexy type connectors in. There is one slight thing you have to do. You have to cut off the little sort of alignment tangs to actually get them to fit in. But once you've done that, when you pop this off, the cover off, you can feed the wires in, you can crimp them, and then you can uh, pop that in there with an LED and it lets you then put an LED of your choice in there. Not just an LED of your choice, but later on if they get dim, and I have to say, that light fitting I just showed you there, which I've just misplaced, these dude salvaged Christmas light LEDs. Literally, I got a cheap set of death trap LED lights from eBay, and I cut the heat shrink, and I took the LEDs out, desold them, and just used them in. And over time, they, they've been lit a lot. They've been lit for oh, eight years, and they've got, they've actually visibly reduced in brightness, so it's quite useful being able to just basically pull out the LED and stick a new one in. So let's uh, go over the, what I'm going to do here. I should tap that back out. Oh, I'll, I'll not push it in there. <laughs> Very well. So I'm going to get white cable. The reason I'm choosing white is it seems a reasonable enough choice of, of lighting wire. It's also one I've got loads of, so that's quite good as well. Let me bring in the notepad and I'll show you what I'm thinking of doing. I'm thinking of making a little sort of Edison screw or bayonet cap little insert that goes into a lamp holder with basically speaking a load of tails coming out, about 20 tails. And each of those tails will have a lamp scattered randomly down. They're going to be in a bunch. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, lots. I'm going to put 20 of them and then just have them all hanging at random heights on flexible cable. It might be that because of the nature of this wire, it tends to be quite sort of springy. I've twisted this, but it's, it's not bad, but I think it's going to have the desired effect. And the idea is that they'll just all glow as a little cascade, a little shower of lights. And the way I'm going to power it, and there's a couple of options here for powering it. If you wanted to do this yourself, if you're not used to working with mains voltage, then you've got the option of the two wires going out, you could have a resistor in line with each wire. So you could have the two wires going out like that. That could be a 220 ohm resistor. And you could have, say, that's a positive, that's a negative. And it goes out to the little uh, cap inside that holds the LED. Or you could just solder the LED directly on. But by putting a 220 ohm resistor in series, it's going to limit the current to about 10 milliamps. And this is good because it's decorative. It's You know you could use 150 ohms if you wanted it to be extra bright. But 220 ohms is ideal because it will run the LED at 10 milliamps just for visual effect. But you could then tail loads of caps, loads of uh, lights out like that with a resistor per, uh, per cap. And that would allow you to run it off 5 volts USB. And... At 10 milliamps with 20 caps, it would total about 200 milliamps, which is nothing. That's going to be comfortable for a USB power supply. But what I'm thinking of doing, I've got a couple of options here. I could go for super low current. I could use a resistive dropper or a capacitive dropper. I want this to be quite visual. I want it to be around about 10 milliamps. So I'm going to go for probably 220 nanofarad capacitive dropper. That depends on your local supply voltage. But here's the idea. I'll have the capacitor with a discharge resistor, it's the classic capacitive dropper circuit. Uh, going to a bridge rectifier, you've seen this circuit so many times, simply because it gets used a lot. It's about as simple as it could get. Let's put a resistor in series, an inrush limiting resistor of, say, about 10 ohms, also acts as a fuse. 
uh, and that's AC in. The output lets use a smoothing capacitor just for so there's less flicker. And then a little resistor in series just so that when I'm messing around with this string of LEDs which will all be wired in series, then removing one, what happens if you have loads in series and sockets is that the when you unplug them, the voltage, this capacitor will have to be 400 volts for that reason, say 4.7 microfarad, which is a common value that's commonly found. I could make it 10 microfarad, it's whatever. But uh, ultimately, one of my ideas is to use existing components from a LED lamp kit. But the idea of the resistor in series, say 1K, is that when you unplug one of the LEDs from a string and then plug another one in, the voltage across that capacitor shoots up because this is acting as a current limiter and the voltage of the, across the capacitor normally sits down whatever it is across the LEDs. But if it shoots up and then you plug an LED back in, the voltage suddenly caps down across that capacitor. Say the combined voltage LEDs, 60 volts, maybe 50 volts in this version, it will go up to about potentially about 330. So suddenly um, almost 200 volts of a difference will result in a sudden capacitive spike through the LEDs. So that's where that resistor is advantageous. Uh, the way I'm going to do this, get this series circuit, is I have put a hook at the top of my bench here. And the idea is... Oh, one other thing. Another thing I fancy doing is 3D printing something. Now, in the past, I 3D printed an adapter for this light. You can see this is a color changing light with color changing LEDs. And the circuitry is in a test tube. And I made an adapter as a previous video where it was perfectly sized to fit this test tube through. And then when this got glued in or press fitted in, uh, it made a nice adapter between the bayonet cap uh, base and this or the Edison screw base. What I fancy doing is making a version that looks like this. Say this is your Edison screw base. I'll make it Edison screw since they're very universally standard. Um, fancy making an adapter that just sits into there and comes down like that, tapers in, and then comes to a little peak that the wires go through. So all the wires come out of that little uh, adapter there and it's got all the circuitry inside it. But that's an option. The first thing I want to do is make this string of lights. I should put this back out of the way. This is attractive. This has been lit for a very long time. Just It, it gradually just morphs through colours itself. That was a separate project. However, moving on. My idea for creating the wiring loom, since I'm going to be making a nasty dangerous mains voltage one, I'm going to potentially mark off some marks on my bench here, or maybe just ad lib it. I'm going to ad lib it, because I did get the idea initially of getting a ruler and laying it on my bench and looping the wire down in loops uh, at roughly inch intervals. But having said that, if you make it too consistent, it looks it forms a pattern. So I fancy doing it randomly. And that's what I'm going to do. So I won't torture you by making you watch the whole of this process, but I'm wrapping that wire around a few times just to hold it in place. And I'm going to pull a big long loop off this wire here. I'm just pulling it off half shot at the moment. I'm going to, and I aim to have the lights in a sort of area like this, basically the height of the bench, to create a big cluster of grapes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it down the first loop, and then I'm going to put it over the hook. And then I'm going to pull it down the next hook loop. Uh, and I'll just let them go in between times, but just to get a rough idea. So that's the next one. Uh, three four, five, six. This is going to be messy. This is not going to work well, is it? But that's all right. This is prototype. Uh, what was that? One, two, how many loops is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is loop number seven. This is loop number eight. Nine. Yeah, this is going to take a while. I shall pause. One moment, please. So here is my cluster of random lengths. And I'm about to start putting it into the bases. But before doing that, I decided to 3D print the uh, the little adapter that's going to adapt it to Bayonet Cap Redison screw. 
here's the first version, as you can see, it didn't go terribly well, uh, but that's okay. The second version is now printing, but I'll be checking it quite regularly to make sure it doesn't pop off again. That serves me right for adjusting the z-axis zero just before printing it, but don't worry, these things happen. I've also made a little tiny resistive limiter adapter for a reason that I'll show you in a moment because I'm going to have to test this as I put each LED in for the simple reason that because they're all in series um, and because these two wires are white uh, to each cap, I don't know the polarity. So I've got a Sharpie on hand to mark those. Now, I shall just lift up my electrical tester for this. And I shall plug it in in redness, redness, the cliff quick test. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to pull out each loop in turn, starting with the ones on the surface, and I'm going to shove them through the cap. I'm going to have to do my best to shove them through the cap before uh, putting the connector on, because if I don't do that, I'll have to cut it back off again to get the, the connector on. So now I've pushed the wires through. I'm going to crop it flush. And I'm going to strip it with a generic Draper stripper. And I'm only going to strip it by about three millimetres at the end. It doesn't have to be much because uh, it's going into crimps. Here's the crimping tool. I shall load a crimp into the crimper and crimp this in. Uh, you can use a basic cheap crimper if you wish. You may have to experiment a bit. So I shall pop the wire in like this. This is the crimper that I got from Rapid Electronics a while ago because it works with these connectors extremely well. It's, it's designed for these connectors. It's not a universal one. I made a video about crimping tools. It's possibly one of the worst videos I've ever made because everything went wrong. And because I'm so honest, it still went in as a video because I like it to, I like to show that things can go wrong, but not quite as much as in that video. So things worthy of note when you're crimping these. If I bring the notepad back in again, when you're crimping, the crimp itself has a sort of scoop that's going to hold the wire in and you lay the wire in the strands in here. And when you use the crimping tool, it's got the, something that looks like the McDonald's golden arches. And as it pushes it up, it curls these round and into the wires. So it's important not to twist the wires because if you do, it can actually, if the wires are sort of twisted across like that, it can actually cut the wires. They have to be straight, which is a bit of a shame really because um, it'd be nicer to twist them and stick them in owing to the fact that it would hold them in place nicely. Uh, and it, when you're pushing them into the crimp bits, if they're splayed out, it tends to stick. So I shall push them into the first holder. It doesn't really matter which terminal I push it into here. I've pre-cropped all the little uh, alignment tags there just because uh, that's going to make it easier for uh, getting it into the holder. And now I'm going to put a red LED in this and the reason I'm putting a red LED in is because I don't know the polarity yet. And I'm going to hook this up to the mains. Now I've chosen resistors in this initial tester. I've got a bridge rectifier and resistors. Uh, let me just doodle that very quickly for you. Instead of this circuitry here, what I've got at the moment are a couple of resistors, European style resistors. I'll draw the other ones, uh, American style resistors. This is how we used to draw our resistors, that little zigzag. But uh, we got stopped doing that under European regulations. We had to draw it as a box. I don't approve of that because I like the zigzags. Uh, plus, minus, and then it's going through my LED string. That's fundamentally it and then returning to this. So this is my tester. So it limits the current through these resistors. And the value I used was about 47K for each. Just designed to limit the current enough so that I don't get a, a zing. Well, I could get a tingle off it, but it's not going to be a bad thing. It's not going to be the end of the party, so to speak. Into the quick test it goes. I also put uh, two on either side just for extra electrical separation. And I'm going to close that down. The LED lit, that means the polarity is uh, positive. That means that one there is negative. So I shall put a wee black mark on that. I shall get my LED, my white LED. I shall stick it in with the negative over there. The white LED lights. 
I shall slide the cover up and I shall pop its cap on. So that's the first one done. It's not very bright because it is just a test circuit. And what I might do at the moment, I may actually just twist this because by twisting it, it keeps those wires together and it also means it's more likely to hang straight. And that's uh, going to drape down nicely from that now. Uh, so I'll move on to the next one and then rather than torture you by making you watch me do them all, I mean, there are some videos that's quite good to do that. But uh, it's it's going to be very time consuming, particularly when I have to try and fumble out each of these uh, circuits. But rather than have you watch me do them all, I shall pause and I shall fa fast forward effectively so you don't have to watch me do it all. It, that will also let me go and check the 3D print is actually 3D printing and not squishing everywhere. So crop, this incidentally is a draper number WS6 stripper. It's a good, typical, cheap, generic standard stripper. It does the job just fine. I just, I had to stop myself twisting those wires around there. That's uh, how much of a habit it is when I'm terminating things like this. Into the crimping tool they go. I'm trying to remember the name of that brand of crimper that I thought was pretty good brand. It was one brand outshone above all the others. And it was a it was a generic Chinese brand, but they seem to concentrate on nothing but crimpers. It's not like those companies that get their finger into every pie and produce substandard tools. Well, you know what? That's still plugged in. That could have been tingly. But not to worry. I did it. Foolish me. So a little bit of current will have flowed through while I was doing that, but you know, these things happen. It's all designed to be a very low current, so it could give a little surprise, but that's about it. The resistors are chosen for that. I could lift the cap of that up, but I've started, so I'll finish. I suppose you could do it live with that setup I've got there, but to be honest, it's going to bite you at some point, so probably not a good idea. The voltage across these two terminals will be about 300 volts, but it will be a very low current. Enough to give you a tingle. Uh, that's with my circuitry that I've added in there to do that. Don't just do it direct off the mains, that would be terrible. Uh, in goes the LED. Does it light? No, it didn't light. Round the other way, it's lit now. So the negative, I should actually put a black dot on this to remind me which of this side is negative. But this side here is negative, so in goes the next white LED. And it should light up suitably. The reason I'm choosing the red LEDs, don't know if I mentioned that, for testing it is because they're much more robust when you connect them in reverse polarity. They don't get as bothered about it as the gallium nitride LEDs do. LEDs do. They can get quite upset about that. That's that cover on. And this time I will actually remember to lift this up. But right now, I'm going to pause momentarily uh, and I'll uh, do the rest of these and then we can continue the project from the point that I've actually got all these caps hooked on with the connectors. So one moment, please. OK, that's the cluster made. It's looking pretty good, I have to say. I've also successfully 3D printed the bit that is going to go into the, the lamp base. I successfully 3D printed it after several attempts. This one got so far, it got almost to the end and then detached the bed. I had, it was, for some reason it was detached from the bed all the time. Ended up increasing the bed temperature and also I thickened up the base but then added a flange afterwards just to make sure this one was a success. That means there's a bit less space in there for getting the electronics in. But I've fed the cables through. I've uh, put a white cable tie around because this is translucent plastic and let's make the power supply for it. So I've got four diodes that I'm going to form into a bridge rectifier. The first ones are going to twist together. We'll have both the positive ends pointing towards each other. That's the both the, uh, should I say, the banded ends pointing towards each other. And at the other end, I'm going to take another two diodes. These are 1N4007 diodes, rated 1,000 volts. It's not going anywhere near that, but that's just a, a really good choice. And I'm putting the non-banded ends up to each other and twisting them together. Then, 
I'm joining the two like this, so that as I place them against each other, they'll conveniently twist onto each other. You'll find out, I mean, when you try twisting one of these together. So that's this one twisting, and this is the AC input on one side. On the other side, this is the other AC input. Now I'm going to lock those by soldering them. Some solder. I didn't plan that bit, just give me a second. Here is the solder. I had a tidy up, and as such, everything has been disturbed, as happens. So I'm going to flow the solder onto this. Maybe I should actually zoom in for this. I should zoom in for this so you get a better view. Give me one second, I shall zoom in. So that's one soldered. I'll go around to the next one. You could also use just a bridge rectifier, a standard bridge rectifier, where it's all in one package. But using the discrete diodes has its advantages. Not even cost these days. It's just as convenient. It's just, well, it's just because I have diodes to hand at all times. So that's soldered, and I'm going to crop these now they're soldered to just about, just over eighth of an inch, just over three millimetres, say four millimetres-ish. And I'm going to fold it so that the DC end is up the way. That's the bands point pointing towards the uh, towards this one. I'll, I'll even mark it with a bit of uh, tape, tape, uh, a, with a Sharpie. So that's the uh, positive there. Where is a Sharpie? There's a Sharpie. I shall just do that, just to double check. And I will be soldering that onto a capacitor. This capacitor. But before I do that, I may actually uh, bend these leads out a bit. Once I pick up the right tool, I've picked up every tool except the right tool so far. So let's bend this lead out sideways and this lead out sideways as well. And the reason for that is just because uh, I want to connect onto these connections as well as onto the bridge rectifier. So let's uh, get helping hands in. I rarely use them, but in this instance, they would be quite useful. And we shall just grip it like that. And then I'll carefully make sure I solder the correct bit on because soldering positive to negative and negative to positive is never a good idea with capacitors. Electrolytic capacitors do not like that, particularly when you're going to be raising the voltage up to something quite significant. 300 volts, open circuit, over 300 volts. Okay, okay, I shall fold that out. I shall gently nudge that down. And solder that onto there. A bit more. Okay, so that's uh, part of the purse. That's the rectifier and capacitor for smoothing. I'm going to... Uh, connect one of the wires on to here, but I'm also going to put a resistor on the other one, and by leaving those leads longer, it's just going to let it stay a bit cooler when I'm soldering and avoid the, uh, detaching again. The next thing I want to do is get my dropper capacitor, which is this, and I want to get the one mega ohm resistor, brown, black, green, and I've chosen a fairly high voltage, uh, well, uh, well, it is a high voltage, it's a high wattage, one mega ohm resistor because that uh, increases the wattage rating. Brown, black, all oh, right, that's the, yeah, okay, I know what I got that for, yes, uh huh, I'm just uh, thinking out loud. Perhaps I should have used the resistor I was going to use for that, but I didn't. So now I've put the one mega ohm resistor across this. It's the discharge resistor for when you unplug it so you don't get a zap off the pins. I use the uh, the half watt one because it's a higher voltage rating than the quarter watt. It's rated for mains voltage. The quarter watt ones are not really quite there. They're commonly used in cheapy Chinese products, but they're not quite the correct rating. So on one of the leads of the rectifier, I'm going to solder one end of the capacitor. So I shall fold that up the way like that, that up the way like that. 
get this into here. Is this a good idea? It's kind of going to fit. And I'm going to solder this lead onto here. Now, how is this going for length? Am I leaving enough room in here by the time I've got that up there and that? Mm, yeah, that'll do. It's kind of getting close to it. Mm. Uh, I wonder if I could have squished this down a bit. I could actually squish this down a bit. Let's save some space because it's going to make it easier later on. By folding these leads over like that. Because it'll still go through the hole. And it'll just save a little bit of space there. So let's solder my longer than expected capacitor onto this. So I'll crop this lead down. Flow some solder on to these connections. Don't know what was going on with the 3D printing. It might just be the shape of the object I was printing was just not ideal. But it caused issues, which was annoying. Another lead of the bridge rectifier. I'm going to solder a inrush resistor. I'm not kind of liking this one. It's kind of big, but not to worry. It's fine. It's also carbon film, which is maybe not quite as good as the metal film for an application like this. Because the carbon fum, 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 fumble ones tend to go bang more than uh, and burst into flames a bit more than uh, the metal film ones. It's unlikely to happen, though. It's a feature. Okay. Righty ho, that looks pretty good. And I'm going to crop these leads down. So that's the inrush uh, limiter, 10 ohm, and that's the capacitor that's going to limit the current through this bridge rectifier, which is then charging this capacitor, which will then power the LEDs. Let's crop that down. Down. This is turning out a bit longer than desired, but that's okay, it's fine. I'll get over it. Um, we have the positive here. I'm going to crop it down. And I'm going to solder a 1K resistor. And the reason for the 1K resistor is to limit the inrush current through the LEDs. If you unplug an LED and plug another one in while it's powered... But it'll also, uh, it may have a positive effect on the ripple. Let's flow some solder on that. And then reflow these together. A little touch of extra flux would be nice. This resistor doesn't get hot, so it's not really going to affect that uh, capacitor too much. Looks pretty good. So... This is going to go on to there, right here. So let's uh, crop that. I think this is going to work first time. It usually does, but you know, now I've said that, I've probably cursed it. I've left the negative long, so it should be ideal. If you wonder why I keep missing the solder connection, it's because all the lighting here is optimised for the camera and not for me. It just makes it a bit trickier to solder at times. Here's the negative. Let's tin it without desoldering it. This is where I do accidentally desolder it. See what happens when doing skeletal wiring. I decided not to use the capacitor that came with a wee LED lamp kit because this one is of more known quality. This one came from CPC, which is better. So now I shall flow this onto the positive which is coming via the resistor and pause to let it cool down so I don't make a dick of myself by pulling it off before it's cooled and then it immediately detaches again and this one I shall crop that wire down and I shall strip that And this will connect LEDs to the capacitor via that current limiting resistor, which is just designed to limit peak current, transients, incidents. I 
This has been quite a time-consuming project, partly because of the 3D printing issues. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a therapeutic thing. It's not something you're doing to manufacture stuff for friends. And if friends uh, see it and go, oh, wow, that's amazing, say, yes, you can build it yourself and promptly don't volunteer to build it for them. OK, here is the assembly more or less complete. Let's gently nudge this back in. Is it going to go in OK? Yes, it's going in OK. Right, maybe I shouldn't put it in completely until I've tested it. It's making scrunching noises and it's not going in. The wires are snagging up, that's why it doesn't really matter. It'll go. That'll be fine. It'll be super. As long as I don't strip the wires in the process of pulling them through here. In hindsight, I should have left that a wee bit wider. If there's any slack, I'll pull it through. Right, before I pull it any further though, I'm going to attach these, but I'm going to sleeve these so we don't have little pops and bangs if they short together. So this is a Bainet Cat base, a UK lamp holder base, which uh, these two pins make connection with the live and neutral, whichever way you're around, it can go either way. But the outer metal shell is not live at all. It's uh, supposed, well, it's supposed to be not live. Certain products sometimes end up with it live, including a recent one, which is an Asda lamp, which is a live shell. Not just live, but through a bridge rectifier. So it's the circuit board that's shorting it on the inside. And once again, there go not just your R1, R2 readings, but uh, your ability of some RCDs to trip. Excellent. Electronics is so sophisticated. So I'm going to put some solder in there, he said, shaking uncontrollably as he did. And I'm going to solder, make sure my sleeves are still in place, and solder that to there. Noting that the insulation is promptly curled back, that's annoying. And every time I go to solder it, I reposition the wire involuntarily, which isn't helping. Either. I think I'll try that again and crop the wire down a bit because the, as happens, the when you heat this up, sometimes the insulation shrivels back. It happens with some colours more than others. It must just be the formulation of the plastic. Uh, where's my flux? I shall put some flux on this connection so it's all moist and juicy. Uh, and then I shall retin that, and it will probably flow back even further. I should try and get into the middle of the shot, shouldn't I? Yes, I should. My sleeves are still in place. One of my sleeves is still in place. The other one has dropped off. Excellent. Glad I spotted that. Let's lock this in place. There's the flux, liberating its fluxy vapours, which is good. There's the bit of sleeve. I shall add some flux to the other connection because flux always makes things reflow better. That's why you should uh, always bring the solder up to something when you're soldering it and not carry it on the uh, solder iron because otherwise the flux can all burn off before it gets to its destination. And now I shall flow this onto here. Oh, yes, that is hot. Mm hmm. Radio. Hot air gun. So I'll push the sleeving down over these connections and I shall give them a little zap with the hot air gun. Just to shrink them on. Just to limit the damage if something does go horribly wrong. It's unlikely to go horribly wrong, but you just never know. This might be the project that does go kaboom. Rightio, now I want to pull this all back into here, and this is where I was having problems. In future, I would make this bigger if I just cracked that plastic. I don't think I've cracked it, but you just never know I might have cracked it. Or is that that's actually the that is actually the cable tie in position. Right, okay, that's not a lot of space. That's not a lot of space at all. Let's gently twist this around and offer it up. I thought I'd made this too big. I clearly haven't. And now I shall squeeze this on and hopefully it will slide on. That is it. Right. This is the cluster. OK. Let's get the hoppy. See if the hoppy has kaboom limitation. I don't think it will have. 
So where is the happy meter? Here's the happy. There may still be a little bit of ripple. Let's check for damage to the wires here where I've pulled them through. I will make that wider next time. Uh, I'm going to do that because uh, when you've twisted them together like this, it really packs the size up a bit. But that's okay. It's fine. Uh, here's the holder. Let's plug it into the hop, eh? Let's plug it in. And it has lit. Okay. Right. Uh, the power is just one watt for all those LEDs. There's 20 LEDs. Uh, current on the AC side is 15 milliamps. And the power factor is a dire 0.2, which is what I'd expect. Because uh, the combined voltage of these is about 60 volts. What is a fifth of 240? Uh, 246, 246 divided by about 5 equals... Yeah, that's about right, actually. That's coming out. That is the difference between the mains voltage versus the uh, AC voltage. It always comes out as a multiple of the power factor pretty closely. Right, tell you what, I'm going to plug this in. I'm actually glad I didn't do another thing I was going to do. I was going to uh, add another LED in here just for visual effect, but there is no room. Uh, by the time you get the cables in and then you get the circuitry, I could have actually done with making this longer. Not to worry. It started off longer by just 10 millimetres, which is about, say, about three-eighths of an inch. Uh, but then I decided, no, oh, that's too long, but it turns out it was not. Uh, these have all ended up, they're not a super wide selection of spacing, but let's plug it in and we'll go and see what it looks like. One moment, please. And here it is, dangling from the ceiling in all its glory. Not too bad, intensity-wise, but really still just intended as a visual light, just a cluster of small lamps dangling out the ceiling. But that looks okay. If anything, I think maybe it would have been nice to extend it down a bit lower. But having said that, it looks quite nice as a clump like this. It's quite pleasing just to play about with it. But there we go. That's the end result. Let me know if you like it by giving it a thumbs up or give it a thumbs down if you don't like it, and we can see what the general opinion is. So that turned out quite well. It's worth mentioning that the camera does not like the fact that these are sharp points of light in here. It looks very different to the eye than it does to the camera. It kind of swamped out a bit, but it looks more like a set of Christmas lights in real life, which is not surprising because it is really just a set of Christmas lights. Things worth mentioning. You don't need a 3D printer to do this project. This was just a whim that I actually used this. I just made a random shape to actually have the, the port for the lights and then the sort of bit that goes into the base. Um, you could just use a box or a plastic tube to actually do this and pot everything in it. It's also worth mentioning that uh, this is the mains voltage version. This is single insulated wire, so it's not really suitable for MD other than yourself, so to speak. It's not something you'd want people playing about with too much. Um, and it's not something you'd give as gifts for liability reasons. However, if you did want to make one that was safer, the USB version is a good option because all you have to do then is have in here, just have one resistor, a sleeved resistor, in series with each one of the lights and it would be 150 to 220 ohms. And then you could drive uh, quite a lot from just a standard USB power supply because at between 10 to 15 milliamps per lamp, you know, even with 30, it's not going to be that dramatic. It's going to be less than half an amp. But that's uh, not bad. It's a nice visual effect. It's kind of nice fumbling about with them as well when they're on, even though it's not the really suitable cable for that. But hey, um, and it'll be interesting. I'll probably end up putting some coloured uh, LEDs or maybe even coloured caps over the standard, the warm white LEDs just for that sort of washed out retro look. But uh, nice effect. I like it. It was quite pleasant to build.